Okay, it's uh, time to leave India and move over to Southeast Asia, a little bit farther. Uh, so for the Southeast Asia ISMER, I'd like to present Dr. Li Wunchu. Thank you, Doc. Uh, first, I want to thank the organizer for inviting us uh, to this very nice symposium. As Jin said, maybe we should have this uh, more frequently, yeah. Right, so, um, so now I'm trying to talk about the ASMR uh, progress, you know, what we have done in Southeast Asia, uh, particularly in the Mekong region, uh, which is uh, very close to um, Pradeep site, right? So, and, and also the uh, north, Northeast uh, uh, India, right? So, um, so our goal is trying to help uh, the regional malaria elimination, trying to accelerate uh, the local, uh, achieving the local goal, right? So our site is particularly located in the, uh, the Mekong region. Here's uh, the Mekong River that runs through uh, China uh, you know, and several different countries in here, including the six countries in this region, which include uh, Myanmar, uh, Thailand, uh, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, and uh, China's Yunnan <laughs> province in there. Right? So these, these different countries here have very uh, drastically different malaria epidemiology. Uh, in Countries like in China, they are trying to limit malaria by 2020. In Thailand, uh, by 2025. In Myanmar, about 2030. So the whole region of malaria goal is trying to uh, eliminate malaria by 2030. 2025, uh, yeah, trying to eliminate uh, false malaria by 2025. So as you see here, so uh, when we selected the study sites and study countries, I mean, you know, there are a lot of uh, interesting uh, things that we want to really want to address in here. There are a lot of challenges for the malaria elimination in this region. One uh, is the large uh, spatial heterogeneity of malaria transmission in this region, especially if you look at here, different countries, uh, Myanmar, Thailand, and China have totally different malaria epidemiology. And also the remote border area, as you know, uh, Pradeep and others have shown in here in this region, is you know, where the malaria transmission is highest. There's a lot of uh, uh, malaria transmission in that region. And also, the, for political reason, for accessibility in this uh, you know, malaria epidemiology in this region is not very, very well studied in some of the remote areas, right? So one problem we talk about is border malaria. So you have different countries with different malaria epidemiology. And then uh, you know, for countries that are you know, trying to limit malaria, you always uh, face this uh, malaria introduction from the neighboring countries. Uh, this is the case that showing that in China, that you know, malaria introduction, especially by you know, uh, the, this middle age group, uh, that is very prevalent. Uh, just one thing I want to uh, point in here, uh, point out in here, it says quite a lot of uh, these uh, local malaria transmission, uh, you know, are not imported in there, right? So here shows another one in Thailand, where you know, uh, you know, malaria introduction from you know different countries, you know, uh, Myanmar, Laos and Cambodia as a major problem in there. So each year, you know, there are a lot of uh, malaria cases being introduced from this region. So um, we think that population migration and malaria introduction, you know, in this uh, uh, border region is very extensive and it's a very uh, major uh, impediment to malaria elimination in that region, right? So again, uh, unlike what uh, you, know, uh, you heard from uh, many other groups that talk about in Africa, you have very of, only a few malaria species in Southeast Asia. In South Asia, you encounter quite many different malaria uh, you know, vector species in there, right? So here's in different countries in the Mekong region, we have a totally different, uh, you know, many times a different malaria uh, vector species in there. And this is based on the old data from you know, WHO from 2007. So in recent years, of course, there are a lot of uh, uh, you know, environmental changes, which you know, uh, you know, uh, deforestation, urbanization, which also shifted the, the malaria species, uh, vector species in there, the composition, their dynamics, and also the biting behavior in there. So that's why we want to address this uh, problem too. Again, so as everybody is concerned, so this, uh, you know, the Southeast Asia, you know, the Great Mekong region is the epicenter of multi-drug resistance. And, uh, you know, there are, in this region, uh, you know, parasites is most resistant to almost all the uh, currently used antimalarial drugs, including uh, artemisinin resistance, which is manifested by, you know, the elimination half-life of uh, more than five hours in, as compared to less than two hours in uh, sensitive parasites. 
So again, so uh, I think uh, the uniqueness of the uh, or as we are trying to address is this, uh, you know, counterfeit and falsified uh, in the substandard uh, anti-malarial drugs in there. So um, you know, as uh, Paul Newton had, you know, uh, study uh, many years ago in in this region, it found more than six some in some countries more than sixty percent of these uh, artemisinins being used are fake, and uh, most of them contain no active ingredient at all, so which is a, a major problem there. Uh, just to give you an example, you see, you know, the counterfeit has so many of these, uh, you know, holograms, you know, uh, in that region, as many as 14 types have been discovered in there. So just trying to bring our attention to say, okay, this fake anti-malarial uh, the drug problem is not unique to Southeast Asia. It's happening in Africa. If you read Paul Newton's uh, paper in 2014, they uh, you know, uh, confiscated one of the shipments uh, in one of the African countries with uh, more than uh, uh, 1.3 million packs of uh, Artemisia lumifantrine and with no active ingredient at all found in there. So that's one, this problem is not, uh, you know, a unique to our site, it's a global crisis, right? So based on these challenges, we try to uh, set our goal, trying to address these problems using uh, with, with these four, uh, you know, projects in there. So including, we try to, uh, you know, get more accurate, uh, malaria epidemiology in there and trying to study the vector biology to see whether there's major changes in vector in there. And also we try to study the mechanism, also try to monitor drug uh, resistance uh, in there. And then again, so we try to develop some um, uh, better method for, you know, uh, for the field uh, application of detection method for the fake artemisinin in there, right? So uh, with, uh, with regard to malaria epidemiology at the border regions, we try to use uh, three strategies. One is trying to uh, perform PCD in some of the hospitals and clinics in there, and also try to uh, you know, uh, do ACD through weekly and biweekly household visits and trying to de detect malaria you know, at earlier phase. And also try to do uh, cross-section studies, and each year we, we do uh, three cross-section studies. One is a pre-peak season, during the peak season, and post-peak season, trying to find you know, what is uh, the malaria prevalence in there, especially the asymptomatic malaria infection in there, right? So uh, just through a picture in here, if you look at just one of the sites in here, and you're in the China Myanmar border area, if you look at the malaria, uh, you know, in, in there, it's, uh, malaria is highly seasonal and mostly uh, happens in the rainy season from May through uh, you know, October. And there are also fluctuations in years. As you can see here, in 2013, we had quite a lot of uh, malaria cases in there. And again, so uh, uh, falciparum malaria is actually uh, uh, almost uh, disappearing, especially in last year, we only had a couple of cases detected in there. So just trying to uh, uh, take a look of this uh, um, picture, in, uh, more, in more close look at the picture, this is in one of the uh, areas that we have been following up. In 2013, there was certainly a malaria outbreak uh, with all, more than 15 to 20 times uh, uh, malaria cases happened in one place. And if you look at here, so as malaria is mostly because of the Vivex malaria in there. So and the malaria is you know, uh, kind of a, a constant, suggesting that in this uh, border region, if you don't pay very close attention, malaria outbreak uh, could happen, and, and it's a major problem that we need to focus on, right? So uh, with regard to cross-sectional surveys, you, you can see here, each time we, uh, you know, uh, we perform these cross-sectional study, microscopy only detects about you know, one to three percent of the you know, uh, participants with malaria. But if we do uh, molecular you know, PCR, qPCR uh, detection, we found more than 10 percent of the, uh, the residents will have malaria. And also just more recently did some of the work showing that these, pe uh, these people, these patients, uh, you know, the carriers, they can infect uh, mosquitoes, as uh, Socrates showed, you know, at a lower capacity, but they can transmit uh, malaria, right? So we think a persistent malaria, uh, the present, uh, uh, presence of uh, asymptomatic carriers, and they may potentially serve as a reservoir for malaria, continued malaria transmission in there. So through this analysis of uh, trying to see the spatial temporal analysis, we found that malaria uh, actually, uh, cases actually are clustered in spatially and also in different times, right? Here just shows one the, uh, example in a larger scale in Yunnan province, China, in several uh, of these uh, counties, we found a clear 
uh, you know, this is Myanmar and this is uh, Yunnan province, several. We found that in some of the townships, malaria is clustered in there. So this is provide some of the local uh, government trying to uh, limit malaria, so our target control strategy that they can try, right? So not only at larger scale, if you look at the uh, you know, village scale, at micro -ge -geograph geographic scale, malaria is also uh, you know, clustered in there. If you look at here, so this is uh, the malaria cases in one of the villages at the Thai Myanmar border area. So the green uh, ones are the people that don't have clear citizenship, suggesting these guys are the ones that migrated uh, you know, from uh, you know, migrating populations. And also, if you look at their economic uh, status, you can see, uh, you know, some of the people, you know, with uh, a clear Thai residence, they have a better, uh, you know, house structure. And well, for people without this clear citizenship, they normally live in, uh, uh, you know, uh, this kind of uh, uh, thatch with, uh, houses with thatched roofs. So that's the reason, you know, maybe uh, malaria is occurring in, this, in, in these houses uh, more frequently, and probably should be targeted in, for future, right? So again, so here are the key points that I want to go through. So basically, uh, you know, we found the clustering of this, uh, you know, malaria in there associated with the economic status. Uh, we think asymptomatic malaria is a potential reservoir in there. And we should target the future for the uh, cross-border migration, which might be a contributing factor to some of the countries that want to uh, eliminate malaria, right? So now I want to, uh, uh, you know, uh, take this approach like uh, <laughs> Bill Moss tried, trying to get touch on all, the, all these, uh, uh, you know, this uh, project we are, we, we are working on. So right, the other ones, uh, we're trying to do a um, malaria vector uh, system study. So we try to do, uh, you know, the uh, you know, adult trap, and also we're trying to sample uh, the uh, larval stage, trying to see what are the major mosquito uh, species, uh, vector species in there. And, uh, you know, there are seasonal dynamics. Are there any changes due to, due to the environmental changes in there? As shown here in the picture, this is one, uh, one of the sites, if you see from 2001 to 2010, there's a, a tremendous expansion of the urban area and also a, a lot of deforestation and also a change of the uh, forest area to uh, banana plantation, tapioca, uh, tapioca and also uh, they grow a lot of these rubber tree, uh, uh, trees in there, right? So we try to address whether this, uh, uh, this environmental change will help, uh, will cause any uh, you know, change in terms of the mosquito survivorship. So what we did is, uh, so we uh, collect mosquitoes, we put them in different uh, you know, environments, uh, deforested area in the urban setting, we put it in plantation, and also in forest, all the in natu nat natural conditions. So we found, actually, this is a, um, uh, what we found with two different species in there, we found that plantation, actually deforestation, favors mosquito survivorship. That's why we thought maybe this is because of the environmental changes, mosquito um, uh, vector species composition may also change, right? So this is, we did a survey in the China Myanmar border area, you know, uh, which is totally different from the textbook, uh, you know, uh, description. We found that the predominant species is minimus, almost 90, uh, you know, uh, almost 90 percent, while other species, you know, kind of are equally prevalent in there. So at the Thai Myanmar body area, so we found there are four uh, major species in there, top uh, anopheles species. Well, you don't see the dyrus species in there, which is, you know, the 2007 WHO description of the major species in there, right? So mostly the minimus is a predominant species, and also in different seasons, in the wet season, we also have a major pro uh, population of maculatus in there. Well, in the post, uh, you know, the uh, you know wet season, and you have uh, uh, Anopheles annularis, and these are the four mosquito species that we also detected uh, sporozoites infection, suggesting there are some new vector species, uh, you know, uh, playing probably important roles in transmitting malaria in this region, right? So uh, one thing that we know in local malaria elimination, uh, you know, uh, one of the strategies is trying to con uh, control vector, right, so vector species. And then, uh, so again, so uh, in this area, we use uh, ARS and also the, um, you know, the bed net uh, to control malaria, right? So the major, uh, you know, insects that are used for this purpose is the deltamethrin. So uh, we tried to use a WHO uh, tube assay trying to assess, you know, what is the, uh, you know, uh, the prevalence of resistance in this region. 
As for the four major species that we collected at the China Myanmar border area, we found that uh, almost all the uh, species are highly resistant to, uh, uh, to the uh, data mass ring, uh, especially Anopheles barbirostris. This is a, a large Anopheles mosquito that's normally prefer uh, plain region, not uh, forested region. So we did some uh, molecular analysis. We found that there is no KDR mutation, suggesting this is uh, probably uh, the metabolic, uh, you know, increased metabolic uh, de detoxification of this one. So in order to address uh, the uh, mosquito, um, you know, management of the mosquito species, uh, so uh, this is an uh, uh, effort led by Gui Yun Yuan's group uh, in UC Irvine. They tried to develop, you know, uh, uh, you know, a larvae side, trying to control, uh, you know, m more effectively control uh, malaria uh, vectors in there. So what they did is they tried to make a, uh, you know, breakage of, uh, you know, with 5% BTI and 5% uh, Bacillus asphericus toxins. And then they put this, uh, you know, into cubics in there. So the large ones can be treated for larger body region. The smaller cubic can be used for the smaller uh, uh, water surface. So what is uh, interesting, this one, we can put this uh, in the, you know, uh, some of the mosquito breeding habitats. Uh, so these uh, cubics will uh, flow, uh, float on the top of it. And, uh, you know, uh, what we found, this is uh, quite significant in terms of uh, controlling mosquito larvae stage. This is a pre-treatment. You can see uh, in both of the treatment and non-treated areas, mosquito larvae is very prevalent. After treatment, we see, you know, a great reduction of the uh, pupil production in this uh, uh, treated habitat. And this thing has, can last for three to, to five months. So uh, this is give us more effectively, uh, you know, controlling uh, vector species, larval species in there. So we think this is probably something additional strategy we could use in the future for controlling, for managing uh, uh, vector species in there. So here's the main uh, key points. I want to skip that one. So uh, the other thing we want to address is antimalarial drug resistance. I just want to give a little bit uh, on that. So um, in the China Myanmar body area, we, first we want to test what is the, the efficacy of the current ACT in treating uh, falciparum parasite. So we followed up the major ACT in there, the DJ, DHA piperaquine. So we, uh, in this population, we found it's still highly effective, this drug, and uh, you know, with 42-day uh, treatment uh, cure rate, is 100%. And also, again, the day three parasite positivity rate is uh, still below 10%. Uh, this is uh, the one that we finished uh, uh, last year. So uh, then we also surveyed the K13 uh, mutation, uh, which is uh, an, you know, a proxy marker for the uh, you know, delayed clearance of the parasites. So as you see here, so in this region, uh, in northeastern uh, North Myanmar and China Myanmar, what area, so we have a total, quite different uh, uh, the uh, you know K13 pattern in there. So as, as you see here, so F446I mutation is most prevalent there and occupies almost 30 percent of that. In. So uh, this slide is trying to show uh, you know, from 2007 to 2012, we see gradual increase in terms of the parasite carrying this mutation, suggesting uh, maybe uh, the parasite is under you know uh, uh, stronger drug selection pressure from 2005 uh, when the ACT has been uh, deployed uh, in that region, right? So here's, uh, you know, trying to do some correlation study, trying to see whether this, uh, the ring survival assay, which is, uh, you know, a proxy method for the in vitro uh, Artemis resistance, trying to correlate that one with, you know, uh, day three positivity rate and also the, uh, the, the you know, culture domain mutation in the K13 gene. We found that uh, uh, indeed, if it's a day three positive, uh, we get a higher chance of this uh, uh, parasite with a higher, uh, significantly higher survival rate, as also the uh, parasite carrying this uh, uh, case couch mutations also uh, you know, significantly higher in terms of the ring survival rate. Right. So again, so we did some haplotype net network trying to determine you know, how this uh, you know, K13 mutation evolve as you know, uh, fund, uh, you know, this is a, a funding that's showing that you know, we've, uh, we do see independent emergence of these uh, K13 mutations, uh, which is uh, you know, uh, further corroborating what you know, Chris Bloss group uh, has found in you know, uh, working on the parasite in Southeast Asia. 
So I was trying to go to the last uh, uh, section. So trying to develop uh, some of the uh, antibody-based uh, methodology, trying to uh, you know deploy it into some of the remote areas, uh, trying to detect uh, uh, you know the fake uh, or for, uh, falsified anti-malaria drugs in there. So what we wanted to do is trying to develop a specific monoclonal antibody so that we can use the four RDTs in there, right? So the antibody we try to detect, you know, this is uh, uh, the artemisor, so which is different in this uh, place, you know, from dihydroartemisinin, uh, artemisinin, and also artesinate. So our strategy is trying to contribute somewhere and opposite to this position so that we can develop, uh, you know, a monoclonal antibody that can differentiate this uh, uh, structure in here. So, but this is very difficult uh, trying to do, uh, you know, uh, organic synthesis. The strategy that we tried is trying to use, a, uh, you know, a microbial fer fermentation, trying to add, you know, uh, some structures in, you know, opposite to this position, so we can conjugate it to these uh, two heptins, make heptins. So then, based on this, we, uh, you know, developed uh, specific heptins, and then we immunized, uh, you know, mice. Uh, then we got, uh, so far we got four specific monoclonal antibodies. One of them is a very specific artemisinin, so with very low cross activity with other derivatives. And uh, the other one is for specific for artemisor. One is specific for artesinate. We also have a pan-specific, uh, you, know, you know, this uh, monoclonal antibody that can recognize and all these uh, structures except artemisor, suggesting we can use that one for, uh, you know, developing a pan-specific uh, uh, deep stake. So the, uh, this is the assembly of the uh, deep stick. The concept is trying to put your sample in there, and uh, you see if this um, control line shows up, this is uh, one that's uh, you know, so it's valid, you can use that one. So if uh, you have the test line, that means uh, this uh, drug uh, is it's a, it's a competitive uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, test. So if you still have the test line, that means uh, there is no drug content or drug content is below this one. If this one completely disappears, that means this is valid with the drug, right? So this is the opposite to what we use for the RDT detection of malaria parasite in there. So in collaboration with several asthmers, including Southeast, uh, the Pacific asthma, uh, South African asthma, the Indian asthma, and also the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, well, the claim asthma. So uh, we tried to test this one in our, uh, you know, this uh, uh, in people who work in the field without specific training. So without, without specific, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, introduction or training. So we just giving them a, uh, in, uh, basically um, in, in, uh, uh, some instruction sheet in, with uh, with the package, so they can perform this in the field site. We found at least uh, some of the uh, uh, the drugs we collected from the government uh, pharmacies, and actually they are valid and uh, for the uh, coral team. So then we did uh, more uh, of this uh, using uh, convenience sampling. We did this uh, test uh, in uh, with, the, with the drugs in um, in, in Myanmar. We threw a collaboratory in Myanmar, so we collected over 100 uh, of these uh, drugs, and uh, we did deep stick assay, and we did uh, also HPLC validation. We found all the ST drugs are kind of contain the uh, respective uh, API, and they are you know, but uh, about 10% of these are substandard. Uh, the, that means the API range is outside of the 90 to 100 percent range, um, but we did uh, find one of the artesinate injection that you know contained no active ingredient at all. So uh, we just want to see all the drugs. If we look at the uh, the label, uh, they are not expired. So it's still um, uh, uh, suggesting there's still some problem in there. So, right. So again, so we developed some of the specific uh, monoclonal antibodies against artemisinin and its uh, derivative, and uh, you know this uh, device is uh, actually working pretty well in the field sites. So we are ready to collaborate with all the other who are interested in there to do this uh, for the testing, uh, you know, since this is a global problem in there, right? For all this, I want to uh, uh, thank all of my colleagues and this uh, great efforts, um, you know, uh, with uh, many uh, institutions participate, and including uh, institutions from the U.S. and also from endemic countries. Uh, thank you for your attention. We have time for a couple questions. We talk all the time, but I've forgotten to ask this question. 
So now that you have so many vectors and you have such good expertise in your isomer for vector work, have you looked at how many larvae you can capture from the field and what fraction grow well and can be infected, or have you not had anything like that going on? Uh, thanks, Pradeep. That's a nice question. So uh, we uh, did uh, get a lot of larvae stage, so, but we did not test whether they can infect, uh, get infected uh, through uh, you know, membrane feeding because uh, you know, uh, you know, your, your rear mosquitoes, they normally don't feed on uh, human blood anymore, uh, on the membrane feed feeders. So that's why we most of the time using lab colonized ones, yeah. But that's something like really nice in the future we can try to study. But all these uh, the uh, insecticide resistance work are based on uh, collected larvae from the from the field sites. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you. All right. Thank you.